Today, I want to remind you of your role in ushering in the presence of God. You have a job to do. And I think you know that, but once you put it into practice, you're going to really truly understand what that means. You need to be a light in the darkness. You need to radiate truth, justice, hope, and love in a world that has lost the understanding of these words. You really have. You were made to radiate. That's the message today. And it'll become more clear as we read. So let's kick, the, kick things off in the Old Testament. If you have a Bible, you can turn here with me. It should be on the screen behind me as well. But we're going to read from uh, the, this, this really nice time where we get Moses after he's received the law from God. It's in Exodus chapter 34. We're going to read verses 29 to 35. So if you have a Bible, you can turn there. It should be on the screen behind me on the case. Exodus 34, 29 to 35. So it says this. As Moses descended from Mount Sinai with the two tablets of the testimony it in his hands, as he descended the mountain, he did not realize that the skin of his face shone as a result of his speaking with the Lord. When Aaron and all the Israelites saw Moses, the skin of his face shone. They were afraid to come near him. But Moses called out to them. So Aaron and all the leaders of the community returned to him and Moses spoke to them. Afterward, all the Israelites came near and he commanded them, to do everything the Lord had told them on Mount Sinai. When Moses had finished speaking with them, he put a veil over his face. But whenever Moses went before the Lord to speak with him, he would remove the veil until he came out. After he came out, he would tell the Israelites what he had been commanded. And the Israelites would see that Moses' face was radiant. Then Moses would put the veil over his face again until he went to speak with the Lord. How many remember this story in Scripture? Yeah? How many remember Charlton Heston with the glowing weird face in the movies? Yeah? Moses was very close to God. Right before this passage in Exodus 33.11, it says the Lord would speak with Moses face to face just as a man speaks with a friend. Now, he didn't actually speak literally face to face. This is a figure of speech to say the common connection and friendliness of their conversations. But he did have a moment where he was allowed to see God's glory from his back. The law that Moses received was actually really special. It was created to set apart a people for God's purposes. Right? The Israelite people, free from Egypt. These people would one day bring forth the Messiah who would save the world from sin. We know that that's Jesus. The law commanded those, or condemned, sorry, those who broke it and revered those who upheld it through sacrifice. That was the law that they had. That was the stone tablets he carried. The Apostle Paul actually writes about this, and he wrote to the church in Corinth about this very special thing. The church in Corinth was always fighting. Now, for, for who was greater, they were judging each other because of social status. There was a lot of things that were happening in that church. And the thing is, is Paul was always really diligent to correct and to write a letter that says, this is how you should serve. This is how we should live. Don't follow after your own passions and ways or ways of the flesh because it's not ideal to furthering the kingdom of God. You need to be people who use the spirit to love one another. Now, many of them practice spiritual gifts. And like prophecy and tongues and, and uh, knowledge and the like. But they often miss the point. 
even though they were still practicing the gift. Many false prophets actually rose up in the Corinthian church and would perform signs and wonders to confuse and sway them away from Christ-centered ministry. How many know that we're here because of Jesus Christ and Christ alone? Amen? That's the key. Sometimes they would lose that. They'd forget and they started to watch other people and their wonderful signs, prophetic actions and words and their tongues. And they would say, I want to follow them. They forgot about Jesus. In his second letter to the Corinthian church, Paul finishes telling them about this ministry of sharing the truth of Jesus Christ and how it is a life and death situation. And then he says this. In 2 Corinthians, this is our core passage, uh, well, this is the beginning of our core passage, chapter 3, 1 to 6. We're going to read this. I'm going to read like a verse or two and then say a little bit of inflection. So you'll see it behind me. If you have the scripture in front of you, you'll know when I'm talking about me. Okay, verse 1 says this. Again, 2 Corinthians 3, verse 1. Are we beginning to command ourselves again? Or do we need, like some, letters of recommendation to you or from you? Okay, so this is a jab at the other teachers coming in with special papers to prove that they're some of us. Okay, they did that. And they have new truths to teach them. Now, Paul was someone who would write letters to people as well. He would write on behalf of Timothy or Titus. And he would send them out with these letters saying, hey, accept my overseer of your church except my friend the person that i recommend so it was common but some people would have their own recommendation letters and things to teach their way to teach what they wanted to and paul's trying to correct them he even this jab right he says are you beginning to command yourselves again as if you're not under the authority of jesus christ anymore or do we need like some those letters of recommendation to you or from you Okay, let's continue on verse 2. You yourselves are our letter, written on our hearts, known and read by everyone. You show that you are Christ's letter, delivered by us, not written with ink, but with the spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of human hearts. Okay, so this doesn't make sense if it's literal, so we have to understand that the Corinthians themselves are the proof that Paul and the other overseers of the church are genuine. You can prove that they're the genuine people because look at the product, the Corinthian people. The people have been transformed by God through the work of the Holy Spirit in their lives. No longer sinners condemned to die, by the law of Moses, that's the tablet reference, but redeemed to live forever because of what Jesus has done. So Paul doesn't need a letter of recommendation. He has the fruit of people being saved and following Christ. Right? So that's pretty special. And he uses that as his reference. Verse 4 says, Such is the confidence we have through Christ before God. It is not that we are competent in ourselves to claim anything as coming from ourselves, but our adequacy is from God. Verse 6, he has made us competent to be ministers of a new covenant, not of the letter, but of the spirit. For the letter kills, but the spirit gives life. See, unlike, unlike the, the false prophets, prophets Paul's con uh, commendation comes from God. And, and the, the proof is in the fruit that he produces in the revived people in Corinth. So the credentials of a false prophet got nothing on the fruit of the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit that resides in them. We're going to keep reading. This is the core part that I want to get to that reflects really well on what we just read about Moses and his radiant face. We had to look back at the Old Testament to understand the new. So let's read this part together. This is again 2 Corinthians chapter 3. We're now in verse 7. I'll read all the way to verse 18. 
Now, if the ministry that brought death, chiseled in letters on stones, came with glory, that the Israelites were not able to gaze steadily at Moses' face because of its glory, which was set aside, how will the ministry of the Spirit not be more glorious? For if the ministry that brought condemnation had glory, the ministry that brings righteousness overflows with even more glory. In fact, what had been glorious is not glorious now by comparison because of the glory that surpasses it. For if what was set aside was glorious, what endures will be even more glorious. Since then, we have much, uh, such a hope, we act with great boldness. Verse 13, we are not like Moses, who used to put a veil over his face to prevent the Israelites from gazing steadily until the end of the glory of what was being set aside. But their minds were hardened. For to this day, at the reading of the Old Covenant, the same veil remains. It is not lifted because it set, is set aside only in Christ. Yet still today, whenever Moses is read, a veil lies over their hearts. But whenever a person turns to the Lord, the veil is removed. Now, the Lord is the Spirit. And where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. We all, with unveiled faces, are looking as in a mirror at the glory of the Lord and are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory. This is from the Lord, who is the Spirit. Now, let me walk you through that passage a little bit to understand more. I do have three points. Is this there? It goes like this. First thing I want you to understand is that the message of Jesus Christ, Son of God, risen Savior, sets a people apart for righteousness. It truly does. Just like Moses bringing down the law, and he shone with these um, this radiance. He brought down these tablets, and it was the beginning of setting apart a people for God's purposes, right? To bring Jesus set apart. Don't act like the ways of the world. Follow these rules. Do something different. Follow my commands. You then will be a different chosen nation. And he brought the righteous one, Jesus Christ, through that nation. We are the message bearers of the good news that reconciliation between a sinful humanity and a holy God is here. That's a really big deal. That we are the message barriers of that truly good news. This is that missional living that we need to have in our lives. Amen? Second thing. So we understand the message was to set apart people. Second thing. Don't veil God's glory. Do not veil God's glory. Moses hid his radiant face for the people's sake. We are radiant with the Holy Spirit and openly shine for the people's sake. Because how else will they understand that there is a God beyond the dark world that they see on their daily existence? They can only see hope and truth when we share it, when we show it, when we live it. The Holy, Spirit's, the Holy Spirit wants to be seen and heard. He does. He is the radiance that points to Jesus Christ, Son of God, risen Savior. And when we share the message of Jesus, teach God's word, pray for those in need, or, or, or we, are, we are radiating this Holy Spirit. That's what we're doing in those actions. Into a dark world that desperately needs Jesus. So we're not here to worship the gifts or the amazing things that occur because of the Holy Spirit. We're not even here to worship the radiance itself. That would be bad. We're here to worship Jesus. And we radiate the truth of Jesus Christ, risen Savior, Son of God. When you walk into a room, do you radiate the Holy Spirit? 
Listen, Listen I'm, I'm not, not talking about prophesying or performing miracles in a moment. moment. I'm not saying that's what you do when you enter a room. That's not radiating the Holy Spirit. If you accept Jesus Christ, Son of God, risen Savior, as your Lord and Savior, you have the Holy Spirit dwelling within you. It's a gift from God. This sinful, corrupted, dark world can sense him in you. The world knows that you're different, knows that you're set apart, as we mentioned earlier. A chosen people, a royal priesthood. But, but if, if you, you put, put up barriers, barriers in your life, like, like greed, pride, worry, fear, fear hatred, hatred, lust, the, the world might not notice his presence in you. Now, he's still in you. He's still there. But you're veiling the radiance. When you let these other things fester in your heart, when you let them in your life and you act on them, whatever, when you're not actually allowing God's spirit to flow through you, to share truth, to be Jesus in the room, you're veiling the radiance of the Holy Spirit. And we're not called to do that. We need to be unveiling the radiance for the people. I'm asking you, do you radiate the Holy Spirit? Or do you veil him to the world around you? Third and final thing, where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. We love that statement because it is true. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. If you struggle to unveil the glory that God has deposited in your life, you are in luck. The Holy Spirit not only works through you to point others to Jesus Christ, right? That's our missional job. Their freedom from the slavery of sin. But he resides in you to prove to you that you are free from the compulsion to live a slave to sin. Did you catch that? The Holy Spirit enables you to teach freedom to others, and the Holy Spirit reminds you of your freedom. That is important. Because so often we think, I can't preach, I can't teach, I can't pray, I can't do this, because I still have struggles. I told you that that's veiling things, but it doesn't stop the fact that the Holy Spirit is working in you, and that the work that conquered sin in your life is finished. Jesus said that. And we need to remember that. Praise the Lord, the Holy Spirit reminds us. Listen to him in your heart, because he wants to remind you. That when you accepted Jesus Christ, Lord and Savior of your life, he is alive and well and you know it. Then that is finished. This idea that you are a slave to sin, that you feel this thought of lust and therefore must pursue it. That's Satan making you think that you should. You don't have to anymore. And if you think, oh, I messed up, I did the wrong thing, I made a mistake. That does not cancel the Holy Spirit's power within you. He's trying to remind you that it is finished. The actions are covered. Your mistakes not cared by God. God cares that you've accepted his free gift of salvation. So don't start living a life where you think that every mistake you've ever made holds you uh, not allowed or accountable or, or permissible to, to pray for people. You are. You are able to do great miraculous things by way of the Holy Spirit in your life, regardless of your struggle, because he's trying to show you that you have victory in Jesus. It's yours. But we forget, often because we're allowing everything to be veiled. We veil it from our own minds. Holy Spirit alive and well within me. I can struggle. I can make mistakes. And then what am I doing? I'm not only... Veiling God's radiance to the world around me. I'm not even letting myself radiate within. The light is so dim within some of us because we don't allow him to shine through. Right? And I'm not here to say that you are condemned or that there's something wrong with you or that you need to be perfect. I'm sharing that we're all actually in the same boat. And God wants to use us anyway. So I want to encourage you to unveil to yourself and unveil to the world. Let's do it together. That sets us on mission for a community 
of darkness that needs that light, needs us to radiate. It does start within. Remind yourself that you're worthy to carry this beautiful, precious gift of God. You are worthy. He sees that you are. He wouldn't give you this gift that you weren't. And he wants to remind you that. Because sometimes we forget. We forget all the time. Let me read Romans 8. If you can follow with me with that. I believe this is a really good commentary on what we were just reading. This is Romans 8, 1 to 5. And then we have time. I want you to ready yourself. Because I would like to have an open altar service of prayer. And I will direct you in what we're going to do. But let's read this first. To set us up to understand the Spirit's work. Romans 8, 1 says this. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus. Amen. Because the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and death. I could say amen after every verse, but you know what I'm saying. Verse 3. For what the law could not do since it was weakened by the flesh, God did it. He condemned sin in the flesh by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh as a sin offering. That's Jesus who took on sin of the world for us. Not something we need to be enslaved to any longer. Okay, verse 4. In order that the law's requirement would be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. For those who live according to the flesh have their minds set on the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the spirit have their minds set on the things of the spirit. How many want a renewed mind this morning? We need to forget about those things, those barriers that block. The fact that we want to veil those things. I don't know if you're carrying shame this morning. I don't know if you think you're not worthy to carry the Holy Spirit within you. I don't know if you keep forgetting those special words. It is finished. But you need to be reminded right now that you have the Holy Spirit within you. If you've accepted Jesus Christ, Son of God, risen Savior as your Lord and Savior. And with that, you can do great and mighty things for his kingdom. You can radiate. And the darkness will flee. Jesus would show up into a town. Demons would show up and they would say, are you here to punish us eternally? What are you doing here? They would freak out. Freak out. Anyway, they would do that, right? And what we do, note this, the same spirit that raised Christ Jesus from the dead dwells in you. If you enter a situation and a place where you feel uncomfortable because something's wrong there, where you notice that there is sin all over, it's dark, it's a mess, you are the radiant light that makes it nervous. Because where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's freedom. And they want to keep this world in bondage. But you bring freedom wherever you go. You radiate the Holy Spirit. So let it engulf you. Let it radiate within, and then let it shine. Share truth. Again, there's great gifts God can use you for. We're teaching about them through a Bible study on Wednesday, but there's, and I'm going to do some on Sunday too, because I really want everyone to catch some of them. They're really good. But the thing is this, just remember, the Holy Spirit's work within you that radiates is the gospel message of Jesus Christ, risen Savior, Son of God. So that's all you truly need. If you're thinking, I don't know what to do. I don't know how to pray. I don't know how to do this, that, and the other thing. Don't worry about it. All you got to do is just share how you met Jesus. Because somebody else has the same story, but you're one step ahead. They need to be drawn forward by you. Amen? That's missional work. That's what that is. We're expanding the family of God by sharing the truth of what Jesus has done. In and through us, and then we bring others along. 